Hi, we're here with Professor Geoffrey Mogul from Canada who's delivered his plenary this morning about nature and nurture and would like to talk to us a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, so uh, I gave uh, my talk tomorrow, it was about uh, the genetic control of pain um, and uh, it turns out that uh, pain features a lot of variability, uh, really an astounding amount of variability. Uh, so people have different sensitivities to pain that vary over a wide range. You can give the same pain stimulus to uh, 100 people and get ratings that range essentially from 0 to 100 and everything in between. Uh, people have great variability in their susceptibility to developing painful diseases after injuries or infections. Uh, so for example, 100 people will be in the same car accident and have the same nerve damage and for reasons we absolutely don't understand, seven of them will go on to develop chronic pain. Everyone else heals up just fine. And uh, finally, uh, there's great variability in response to analgesics. You give the same dose of morphine or the same dose of aspirin to a bunch of people, and some of them it takes all their pain away, and others it doesn't even touch them. We know from twin studies uh, and also animal studies uh, that a little less than half of this variability that I've been talking about uh, is genetic in nature. Uh, and so a lot of people are trying to find the genes. Now this turns out to be uh, a very big job because there's approximately 22,000 genes in both people and mice and rats. Uh, and the question is, well, which ones are involved in pain and which ones produce the variability in these uh, cases that I've uh, mentioned? And the good news is, is that uh, we're getting very good at finding those genes. The techniques are becoming very powerful. Uh, obviously, the Human Genome Project and the Mouse Genome Project uh, have really helped make it very straightforward. I won't say simple, but at least it's straightforward to find these genes now. Uh, the bad news, I guess, is that it's turning out uh, that there's uh, quite a lot of them. We sort of naively thought at the beginning that maybe we were looking for three or four genes, uh, and now I very strongly believe that we're looking for hundreds of genes, maybe thousands of genes. And of course the problem with that is, is that if there really are thousands of genes, and today we know, oh I don't know, maybe about 25 or 30 of them, uh, we really haven't gotten very close to the answer. Uh, but then on the other hand, technology is advancing and we're getting faster, and uh, maybe uh, before too long, uh, we'll have a better uh, handle on things. And so I was uh, telling the audience about the sort of possibilities of pain genetics and the continuing challenge, challenges of pain genetics. That sounds really promising. And what's the message on pain you'd like people to have? Well, I think the big thing, and I say this, and uh, all other pain uh, uh, um, researchers and pain clinicians say this, the thing that the public uh, doesn't understand about pain uh, is just how shockingly prevalent it is. Pain is more prevalent than cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. Uh, it is uh, responsible for more burden of disease uh, than anything else. The only thing that comes close is depression. Um, it really is uh, uh, the major scourge uh, of the world in terms of health problems. And yet, because different pain problems have different names and people think of them in different categories, they don't lump together back pain and neck pain and arthritis and migraine. They think of them as separate things, but they shouldn't be thought of as separate things. They should be thought of as one single disease chronic pain. And it is in fact its own disease. These are not just symptoms of other diseases. When pain becomes chronic, whatever the precipitating factor was is actually no longer relevant. Now the disease is pain and it needs to be studied and funded independently. And if people could understand that, I think that uh, more attention would be paid to the topic. Governments would be under pressure to fund the problem at the level that it deserves to be funded. Uh, people would uh, have walkathons and bikeathons and bakeathons to come up with money to fund uh, cures or uh, better treatments for this really serious hidden health problem. Jeffrey, thank you so much for your expertise and coming down to Hobart to share it with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've had a really good time here.